You all know that I beat depression yeah. with the help of my faith yeah. and with the love of Jesus. Amen. Well, you don't know half of what I had to go through to get where I am at now. So here's my story. Hallelujah. A second chance. In the beginning of 10th grade, I started to get clinically depressed with a freaky voice. And it was almost like the TV was talking to me. Then, the next day of school, I noticed there was something really strange going on. I started getting dizzy and not knowing where I was. Then in the classrooms, like math and moral history, the problems were first grade, like two, three, three plus one, and uh, in moral history, everyone was clapping when I was doing, and then finally my parents took me to the hospital and they took they took out like half of my blood and it didn't phase me or anything. They said it was depression. For three weeks I was in the hospital and started to get hives. Yeah. I remember Pastor Marth brought me chocolate covered pretzels. <laughs> I didn't even speak, not even when the nurses asked me for a popsicle. Then finally they took me to a rehab center. Um, this was when they got Real interesting. I still wasn't sleeping. Then the nurse finally knocked me out with sleeping gas and I went to sleep. I remember saying I wanted to die. Then my spirit left my body, but I was still moving because Jesus said in a whisper, I have your back. Hallelujah. Oh, oh. Um, then I saw the devil on a computer and he said, Who is your father? I did not speak. Then God rose me from the dead after I said, I love Jesus. Then at the rehab center, the whole, uh, the whole arena of Blackstone, my old youth group I went to, was praying for me. And one night God had two people, two angels, come help me even though they weren't there. The whole time I was in the rehab center, the angels were there. And they even helped me with my math work and they played on a playground with me. Then, before the 2008 Battle Cry event, God saved me from eternal death and gave me eternal life. Hallelujah! So even though I gave up on God and wanted to die, He never let go of and He never gave up on me. Amen. He won't give up on you either. If you have the faith, so all you need is the faith of the mustard seed. That Sunday night, I, I got hands laid on me for healing. Yeah. Four days later, at the elementary school, kids were asking me what's wrong with my legs. 
I said nothing was wrong. Then I explained to them that I am no different than anyone else. Yeah. Because I am a spiritual being. Then during basketball at Extreme, I said, I won't need my pads at all or my helmet one day. Then before I went to bed, I said the same thing that I said to the kids. Then my heart smiled and I cried tears. Tears of joy because I knew it was my heart. That I was. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Woo. We are a turn and it's to all of us. I told you before, but when I went to visit you in Richmond, I didn't think you'd be back. I didn't have faith for it, Tammy. But I learned, thank God for Dad Hagen. Dan Hagen told us something many years before. He said, when you see someone has faith for something you don't have, just don't say a word. Put it in neutral. Even if you can't help them right then. And I didn't have faith for it, Tammy. This lady had tremendous faith. Hallelujah. She knew. Thank God for her faith. But if you see somebody and you know you don't have faith, just smile. Don't let them have any idea you don't have faith for this. And let them go for it. Because honestly, I think you were operating the gift of faith. It was so hopeless. And we're so proud of you, and I thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't yeah. God good? God is so good. And it goes so perfectly with what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the grace of God, what the grace of God really is. Amen. Children are quietly dismissed. But I think you'll see exactly here how this ties in, because you are here tonight by the grace of Almighty God. He has graced you to overcome depression. Let's go to John 1, 16 to 17. I've been thinking all night tonight how shallow my understanding of grace is. I don't know what I thought it was, but I didn't have much of an understanding, and I realized I'm just learning. John 1, 16 to 17. For of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. It says in verse 16, grace upon grace. Now listen to this. From the moment we're born again, we start changing. Yeah, that's right. Our wants, our desires, our motives, and the whole way we look at life changes the moment that we're born again. And that is God's grace beginning to shape the new us. Very often, we don't even, we're not even aware of the fact that His grace has changed. Are you following this? Yeah. We went from being a selfish brat, or at least I did, I was a selfish brat. To be someone who cares about people because his grace began to reshape the way we thought. In 1 Corinthians 15.10, some of these are from this morning. We'll just have a little review. Paul spoke often of the grace of God. Now, before we read this, I'm going to tell you why he's talking to you about the grace. He didn't ever want to limit how much grace he could receive. Yeah. If you want to limit the grace you can receive, start taking credit for it. Oh, yeah, I'm real good. It's okay to be good at that, but give God the glory. It's by His grace. Look what He said. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. What was He? A hugely important apostle. The most important single figure in Christianity, apart from Lord Jesus Christ Himself. Right? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored. Now, this is an interesting point in the verse. A lot of times we think, well, if the grace is there, we don't have to labor. We labor. We do everything we can do, but apart from the grace, it's not enough. But he said, but I labored even more than all of them. Yeah, not I, but the grace of God with me. When you get up, put one foot in front of the, of the other tomorrow, the grace of God is there to meet you. Okay? Grace is not an excuse not to do what we can do. But the truth is that after we've done all that we are capable of in the natural, it is his grace that puts us over the top. The only reason we as a church are here, it's why Jared's here. It's, you know, how, thank God. It's why our marriages are making it. Amen. It's the grace of God. Paul understood that grace is God's divine enablement to change and accomplish what we could never do without his ability in us. Paul not only acknowledged the grace of God in his own life, but he talked to his protege, Timothy, and he said, you get strong in that grace. Yeah. 2 Timothy 2, 1 says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
be strong. And what is that grace? That grace is the ability, whatever ability you don't have that you need. You see, a lot of times, I guess this morning, when I mention for, uh, forgiving somebody and I feel people drawing back, I think, oh my God, we should spend six months on this until people have the faith to forgive. Because you can't go anywhere in God without forgiving. When you receive forgiveness and you're not willing to pass it on, you are stuck. Now listen, there's a grace to forgive. When people look me in the eye and they say, I can't forgive, that's not true. You won't forgive because the grace is there to forgive. The grace is on, listen to this, there's grace to live holy. Now you may not cooperate with that grace and you may fall into sin, but the grace was there to live holy. On the day that you stand before God Almighty and you say, I just couldn't do what you called me to do, he'll probably be nice about it knowing him, but he'll say the grace was there to do it. You understand? The grace is God's ability and strength to do what you cannot do in yourself. There, there's grace to rejoice in, in a trial. Hallelujah. So our strength, ability, favor, blessing, they all flow from his grace. And they're actually his strength operating through us. Now, I, part of this is still review, but who qualifies for more grace? Let's look at James 4, 6. I'm not sure if we can get reminded of this too often. James 4, 6, he says, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud. I like to say it that way. It's the same thing. God is actively an enemy of the proud. I like to say it that way because it's so strong that I just don't want to be proud of them. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter says the same thing. Over at 1 Peter 5, there's a little more to this passage. A little more detail. 1 Peter 5, 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now here's a question. Is humility a real spirit? Could you actually, if you were clothed with humility, would you be clothed with humility in the natural or in the spirit? In the spirit. You understand, you could clothe yourself with arrogance and haughtiness. Haven't you seen somebody that just had haughtiness all over them? I mean, you could almost see it without having spiritual life. Yeah. But in the same way, you can clothe yourselves with humility. Yeah. What does that mean? It means you're down to earth, you're real, you don't have on pretensions, and you know that you're victorious. I'm victorious, but I'll tell you about it. I'm victorious by the grace of God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He gets the glory. Whenever you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, Look at, let's look at the next verse, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Humble yourself under God's hand and giving him your worries are, the, are one and the same. You come under his care, you say, guess what? I got this, this, and this, and can't do it. Would you help, please? And you, this is how, do you know what grace is like? I was on the way to church tonight. Grace is like manna. Manna was awesome, but it wouldn't keep till the next day. By the next day, it was wormy. Yeah. And if you try to live this today on yesterday's grace, you're probably going to fall flat on your face and lose your temper and whatever. Grace is something you receive every single day. I mean, there's just nothing like start your day with God, even if it's 10 minutes. And I mean, two hours is awesome. I love the days when I can have two hours just with God. But to have 10 minutes. To put the whole thing right out on the table. Guess what? You've called me to do something I cannot do. You've called me to do something I have no idea how to do. I can't love the way you, yeah. you, say, you say all that yet. Because in being real with God, you qualify for grace. Yeah. And um, you need to be reminded too. <laughs> because, oh well, hallelujah. Yeah. Who gets grace? Those who give glory to God. Like Paul said, by the grace of God I am what I am. Those who humble themselves. Now the rest of it is not review. How do we receive his grace? Let's go to Psalm 45, 1 and 2. We may have read it this morning, but we didn't have time to talk about it. Psalm 45, 1 and 2. I understand I was raised in a word of faith circus where word, the word was very important, but I honestly do not believe you can overstate the importance of this book in your life. When you minimize its importance, you minimize the grace. 
Why would that be? I'll show you. I really open to being shown. Yeah. Psalm 45, 1 and 2. Um, it's, a, it's a song about Messiah. My heart overflows with a good thing. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. The New American Standard Mar Margin says it can be translated, grace is poured through your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Now think about that. John 1.16 said that of his fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. Well, how did grace upon grace get from him to you? Okay, read it again, verse 2. You, Lord Jesus, are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured through your lips. The grace that you need for every area of your life is in this book. His, the Bible says in Revelation, his voice is like the sound of many waters. I want to tell you what kind of waters they are. They're waters of grace and waters of blessing. You could be having nightmares at night. There's grace in this book to stop the nightmares. Yeah. So Psalm 91, full of the protection of God. What, is, what does that mean? That means that you take the grace that he's spoken and you get it into your heart and you put it out your mouth and it changes circumstances. Yeah. If you can get still, now think about this. It says, everybody say grace, grace. is poured through his lips. Poured and I'm going to give you another scripture to confirm it in a minute in Luke chapter 4. If you can get still in his presence and read the word with the ears of your heart, you receive grace for that day. You hear from God. Sometimes it is the Holy Spirit speaking to you specifically about that day. When I first started, it wasn't. I couldn't hear the voice of God. But let me tell you what I did do is I love this enough to keep listening. And it's just like you all, y'all listen to me preach for a while pretty soon. I call you on the phone, you know who it is. Why? Right? Just because I've talked so much. <laughs> You've heard. You know my voice. If your husband or your wife calls, I hope they don't have to say, hello, this is your husband. No. <laughs> right? If John calls, I assume you would know his voice. You know why you know his voice? You've heard it a whole lot. Yeah. You know whose voice rings through in Genesis and Psalms and Matthew and Mark and Luke and Acts and Romans and Sephirs and Seth? The Holy Spirit's voice. And if you get to know his voice very well, all of a sudden one day you'll hear him say something like, oh, and you don't have to guess, oh, is that the devil or God? No, you know his voice. Yeah. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Yeah. So until you get to a place where you know his voice, his grace is going to come right through this written word. And there's plenty of it there. If you can get still in his presence and read the word and hear what he has to say, he will grace your life with exactly the strength you need for that day. Go to Luke 4. We read it this morning. Luke 4, verses 18 to 22. Jesus' sermon is preaching. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because it has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of all the synagogue were glued on him. Everybody's looking at him. He began to say, you just, that scripture you just heard? Fulfilled. Here I am on the side. Ooh, that's boldness. I love you, verse 22. They were all speaking well of him, wondering at the gracious words, the words of grace that were tumbling out of his mouth. Just exactly like we saw in Psalm 45. When you speak, there's grace coming out of your mouth. You know what you need for tomorrow? Grace. Yeah. Hallelujah. How will the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ come into your life? This book is called in three different places the word of his grace. If you go to Acts 14, 3. I'm talking about Paul and Barnabas here. Therefore, they spent a long time there for speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to something with signs and wonders. The word of his grace. If you limit the amount of word in your life, you limit the amount of grace. And you say, can you show me that in the Lord Jesus Christ life? Yeah, if you go to Luke chapter 2, I'll show you exactly why, what it says about him. Go to Luke chapter 2. He's our example, right? Yes. 
In Luke 2.40, it says that he grew in wisdom and stature. Luke 2.40, the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Can any of us argue with that? Even as a child, the grace of God was on Jesus. We'll look at four, just six verses later, verse 46. This is 20 to 12. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, doing what he wanted to do. Between you and me, nobody made it through this. Okay? I put that in there, but it's true. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting with the teachers, listening to them, asking questions. Why does he love the word of God? Yeah. Love the word of God. One more understanding about the word of God. Wanted somebody to talk to on his level about the word of God. Amen? Yeah. Verse 7, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. You have to understand that back then, that their little kids would memorize the first five books of the Bible. Yeah. To this day, some of the really strict Jewish people memorize the first five books of the Bible. So we're talking a lot, a lot of scripture. Now you can say the grace of God would have been on him without the Bible, but I believe it was the word of his grace that activated. You see, I don't know. If there's any grace on my life, I'll tell you where it started from. You want to know where it started from? It started with me going nuts over the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to help you here. The, the grace for everything you need, the grace to forgive is in this Bible. The grace to be fearless is in this Bible. The grace to walk with God is in this Bible. The grace to take authority over the devil is in this Bible. The grace to have a good marriage. It's all in the Word. Our problem... We just don't see this word the way he sees it, high and lifted up. Jesus Christ, it says he grew and the grace of God was on him. And he had massive amounts of the word of God. Do I think I have as much of the word as I should? No. But that iPad has really been a help, I think. <laughs> I love that iPad Bible. Oh, it's fun. But I'm, I'm just falling in love with the word of God again. You see, you have to understand something. If I get a real vacation, like two days at my parents, my parents still think I'm nuts. I'm on the back porch and they like my Bible. And they're sort of like, this is your vacation. I said, yeah, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm not yeah. looking for something. I'm here for God. I love this Bible. I, this Bible can take anything in your life that needs change and turn it right side up. Can it, Jerry? You're here by the grace of God. When Paul left Ephesus for the final time, can you imagine planting a church, seeing a church grow mighty, and knowing there are no cell phones, there is nothing, no Twitter, there is nothing, and you're saying goodbye for the last time. They bawled because he said, you're never going to see my face again. Look at Acts 20, 32. He has to leave them. And you know it's scary. You know it's breaking his heart. At 2032, he's saying the final goodbye, and he says, and now I commend you to God to the word of his grace, which is able to do two things, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among those who are being sanctified. This is not an empty word. This is not a valueless word. This is not like you take your Bible up and you did nothing. No, you pick up your, your Bible and you hear from God with an open heart. You're getting your life full of the grace that you need to triumph that day. Yeah. What was the word of God in that verse according to Paul? Now understand, he was leaving this church that was part of his heart. He founded the church. He loved the church. And he's never going to lay eyes on him again. He says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. Because that word of his grace will build you up and give you your inheritance. Two things. Build you up and make you strong and solid in the faith and give you your inheritance. Now, if you're not cheering over your inheritance, it's because we're clueless about what our inheritance is. Listen, your inheritance in Jesus Christ is absolute right standing in peace with God. No condemnation. Your inheritance is bold access to the throne of his grace 24-7 until he comes for us. Your inheritance is authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And you can say, well, where would I get grace like that to walk on top of the devil? Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, I give you. Can you hear the words of grace coming out of his mouth? They're not empty words. They sat there marveling at the words of grace tumbling out of his mouth. Isn't that what it said? Psalm 45 said, grace is poured through your lips. 
This Bible will pour grace into your life. And that grace isn't just this ooey feeling. I never knew what grace was. Grace is the power to do what you've got to do. Is Grace is the power to believe what you've got to believe tomorrow. Look at, can we go to Luke 10, 19? We had somebody in the church struggling with nightmares. I've been through this with Christiana when she was six years old. I don't want to tell you something. There's grace in this Bible of stuff nightmares, isn't there? Isn't that awesome or is that awesome? I love it. I was not afraid. I knew that if I, you know, for a couple nights, we'd pray together. Can I tell them your testimony? It's, it's Abby. Dear, sweet little child. Horrible nightmares. They live in Maryland. Do you know how much difference that made? Zilch. There's zero distance of the spirit. They'd call up, we'd get the scriptures out, and we'd pray. She'd sleep. And then the next night, maybe we wouldn't pray that she wouldn't sleep. But now she's got it. You know why? Because it's not a revelation just to her pastor now. It's a revelation to her that Jesus Christ gave her authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing will injure her. Now I want you to understand that verbs, those words, are spiritual containers of authority. And though that authority is the grace she needed to triumph in her life these past two weeks, isn't it? And when she heard the grace that poured out of his lips into her heart, she started winning in life. I want you to understand when Paul said his grace is sufficient for me, that doesn't mean I'm just muddling for you, but I got gooey feelings. No, 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 no. His grace is sufficient for me to have faith and victory right in the middle of any storm I ever go through. Are you following? Yes. What is the inheritance that Paul said, the word of grace? It's the authority to heal the sick. Yeah. Just like they prayed for you. That's, that was grace. But we don't have to be sick anymore. Your inheritance are financial resources to accomplish your mission. Children who are taught of God and hear from God and we have great shalom. I don't know if you meant it too happy. That makes me happy. Yeah. My kids are grace of God. So are yours. Awesome. Grace. Your inheritance is light arising in darkness according to Psalm 12 in a dark situation. Now, the last thing I want to share with you, because we're almost done here, is you're supposed to boast all the time. Yeah. You're just not supposed to boast about you. Yeah. Okay? 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I want to look at three scriptures. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Paul is bragging about the grace of God. And you say, why wouldn't that be arrogant? No, he's not bragging about him. He's bragging about God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I mean, I just like to tell you my testimony. Brag about God. Yeah. I've heard it 20 times. But honey, I'm going to tell you something. i got a lot of people that will never, ever, as long as I live, accept the fact that I'm a pastor. Because <laughs> I'm nuts. In their book, I'm nuts. I was nuts. I was mental. I was depressed. Okay? But the grace of God. Yeah. The grace of God took the nuttiest, weakest person in the whole extended family and changed things. Yeah. Again, you sound mine. And a rock solid faith. Oh, in the presence of God. Mm. And the authority to walk on dead. dead. Isn't that awesome? I love mm. that. That is something. That's the grace of God in somebody's life. Yeah. Yeah. And when you brag on that, you're not bragging on you. Trust me, honey, I'm not proud of the fact that I wanted to die instead of live. I'm not proud of it at all. But I'll tell you what, I know the one who gave me a reason to live, and I'm happy to live every day that I live. Oh, yeah. And I'm happy I brag on him. Yeah. He, the Lord, said, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. What does that mean? The weaker you are, the more his grace gets glory. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. I mean, if I started out a real together, outgoing person, then it would still be a great thing that he'd done in my life. But if you knew what an introvert and hermit, that I didn't leave home for a year because I didn't want to see anybody and I was terrified of people, and now I'm here and I could care less what you think because I have found the joy of life, that's a huge glory to the grace of God. And there is nothing he's called you to do that he can't grace you to do if you give him the glory. Everybody say his grace is enough. His grace is enough. And say his power is perfected in my weakness. Look at two more scriptures on bragging. You need to learn to brag. Go to Galatians 6, 14. Everybody say that. I need to learn to brag. Now Paul is explaining boasting in no uncertain terms here. Paul says, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I the world. 
Now, he's not really ready to love the cross. The cross was an instrument of torture. That would be like bragging about the rack, or bragging about an electric chair. And I will tell you what happened at the cross. That the cross was provided for you everything you would need in this life and the next to be totally, completely victorious. Yeah. He said, let me brag about the grace that came into my life yeah. because of the cross. May it never be that I should brag except I'm going to brag day and night and night and day about what God, the grace that God will do for you yeah. if you just open your heart and give him a chance. And the very last one, let's go to Jeremiah 9. I love the scripture so much. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. I don't care how smart you are. Three PhDs. Don't brag about that. Amen? Yeah. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. I don't care if it's political power you've got or physical power you've got or whatever. Don't boast. And don't boast about how much money you're making. But if you've got to boast, do this. But let him who boast, boast of this. Two things that he understands and knows. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things. We're supposed to boast about God. We're not just supposed to think, oh, I know Jesus Christ. We're supposed to boast about who he is and what he does and how much he changes. Yeah. Because the truth of the matter is people, people are looking. They'll claim not to be looking. They're looking for anything that works. They're just looking for reality. The reason the church is going to grow from saying, oh, it's about, you know what's happening. There is this word that's chock full of grace to everybody that opens it and opens their heart to it. The more you open your heart to the word of God, the more grace you're going to walk in. Yeah. Do everybody see that? Yes. And the reason the church will grow, people are looking for reality. They just sure. want something that's real. Yeah. Amen? And I don't know if this message makes you want to worship it. I don't know. Something about your testimony, Jared, it reminded me. Because you see everything you talk to me about. They told my parents put me in the room and throw away the key. I don't tell everybody that. And they say, oh, you're still not still that. <laughs> but you know what? Isn't it a glory to God? Yeah. That the person that didn't even want to live has so much joy they can't even hardly even stand it because there's so everything you need is in it. Name something you're up against tomorrow. I'll find you the scripture of his grace in that scripture. Yeah, that's true. Completely over. Isn't that quite true? There is not anything that isn't covered in this work because grace is poured through his lips. I think we should worship. Let's just worship everything.